Hello, we're gonna spend some time practicing. We're actually going to uh, uh, do two things at once effectively. Um, we're going to take ordinary language uh, syllogisms and rewrite them in standard form. And then we will use Venn diagrams to test those syllogisms for validity. Now, you already know that it is not necessary to put an argument, to put a, a syllogism into standard form in order to use a Venn diagram method of testing for validity. But we're going to do it uh, for a couple of reasons. One, as I mentioned already, it's um, an efficient way of practicing effectively two things um, together. But secondly, it, it, more importantly, I think, it's going to be helpful to you to see the argument in as clear and consistent a structure as possible um, and just working systematically is, is good practice. So we've got a bunch of exercises. Let's go ahead and first rewrite the argument so that we put it in standard form and then we'll use the Venn diagram method, um, the, the method of the um, uh, modern interpretation to test the argument for validity. Okay, so we've got the following. Bunnies are fluffy and they reproduce with great frequency. Therefore, fluffy things reproduce with great frequency. Now, first thing, and this goes all the way back to chapter one, um, is make sure that you know what your conclusion is. So I'm going to use um, a color pen to identify our parts, right? Here's our conclusion, right? Fluffy things reproduce with great frequency. Um, now, the next thing we want to do is identify uh, what type of proposition we have. Remember, it's typically the case that uh, implicit quantifiers, that is, quantifiers that are um, inherent in the sentence but not stated in language are typically universals. So uh, fluffy things reproduce with great frequency um, is an implied universal. So I'm going to put um, an A claim, an A letter, or the letter A, sorry, in a circle so that I know that we're dealing with a universal and it's an affirmative because there's no negation anywhere. I also want to identify my classes of thing, right? Right now, we don't have an explicitly stated um, copula, a conjugation of the verb to be, uh, that tells us which of um, the sentence elements is our subject class and which is our predicate class. Uh, but let's try the following and see if it sounds right to you. Fluffy things are things that reproduce with great frequency. So what I can do is put a put the copula here, and I know that that looks like I wrote all, but that's because I can't use this pen well. And uh, now we know what's what. Um, so what we can do is this, is let's draw a line and let's put our conclusion here. We have all subject class fluffy things are predicate class things that reproduce with great frequency. Now let's go ahead and find each in the uh, respective sentences. So um, let's start with the top. We have bunnies are fluffy uh, if we uh, make the adjective fluffy into a noun phrase, we'll have fluffy things. So that is going to be our minor term, remember? Our minor term goes in the minor premise, and the minor term is the subject of the conclusion. Um, and they, that is fluffy things, are things that reproduce with great frequency. So things that reproduce with great frequency is our predicate class. And I'm sorry, I misspoke just a moment ago when I mentioned they. The reference actually is back to bunnies. Sorry about that. I said fluffy things and I, and I misspoke. Okay, 
So this means then that um, we've got two sentences. Bunnies are fluffy and they, bunnies, reproduce with great frequency. That means that bunnies is our middle term. So let's go ahead and move uh, the elements into the right position in terms of uh, major premise on top, minor premise on the uh, second in the order, and then we already have our conclusion in, um, at the bottom. So bunnies are fluffy becomes uh, M, R, S, and how many bunnies? Well, again, the implicit quantifier here is an all. And then they, bunnies, reproduce with great frequency, all, M, R, P. Okay? Um, what we'll do as we're working through this exercise, or sorry, these exercises, is we'll take different approaches. So. The first uh, thing I did was I looked for the conclusion, and in fact, we will do that always, 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 first, 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 but maybe we will take um, a slightly different approach to working out the rest of the elements. Um, so here I just wrote, as you can see, you know, M, S, P on top of the relevant sentence, but maybe, or sentence elements, but maybe there's going to be a time where instead of doing that, I rewrite the sentence um, completely uh, before putting it in uh, final standard form. Okay, so now we've got our elements and I'm going to change our pen color to black for the following. And you already know that I don't do the best job with um, drawing on the computer by way of a bamboo pen, but that's not so bad, is it? Okay, so um, our standard practice is the following. We have uh, the subject class and predicate class, which is the minor and the major terms on respectively the bottom left and right uh, uh, circles. And then the middle term is at the top. Um, you may open up some textbooks where the configuration is different. For example, you might have the middle term um, circle underneath the subject and predicate, the minor and the major. It doesn't really matter, just make sure you identify everything clearly. Okay, so one way that you can approach things is as follows. Pull apart so that you're not confused by all the different circles overlapping. Pull apart your elements. And you'll notice that uh, M is consistent with both, right? So you've got uh, the MS relationship or SM relationship, and you've got the MP or PM relationship. Then what we can do when we're done diagramming is bring those elements, bring what we diagrammed up here. Okay, so uh, let's start with the first uh, sentence, all MRP. We shade the area of M that's outside of P. I think I can probably make the, um, what am I trying to say? I can probably make the um, uh, ink thickness a little bit um, more robust so that it doesn't take so long to shade. But in any case, we got that. So all MRP, now let's move over here, all MRS, and I think you're clear that when we uh, shade our sentences, or sorry, when we shade a, a class in a sentence, what we're doing is using our standard approach to the Venn diagram, right? We shade, uh, sorry, we diagram one sentence at a time. So when we're diagramming all MRP, we're just dealing with these two classes, the M class and, or sorry, over here, the M class and the P class, all M are S, the M class and the S class. So the, the first rule of diagramming your syllogisms is you always only diagram your premises. And then when you're diagramming a single premise, you're dealing only with the classes that are relevant to that premise and you are effectively ignoring the third class. So that's why I think sometimes pulling them apart helps a little bit. So that you can see now when we go back 
to take this diagram, the MP relationship, and plug it in over here, we're diagramming the MP relationship without um, taking into consideration the S class because the S class isn't relevant. So we diagram as if that area of the S class isn't um, around. It's as if it doesn't exist. Then when we go to diagram the M and the P, or sorry, the M and the S class, right? We're diagramming the area, we're shading the area of M that's outside of S, and that means that in this case, we ignore the P class. Now, the fact that there's some shading here um, doesn't change the fact that all M are still S, right? Because whatever M's there may be, they'd be dumped into this area, right? So the fact that this area is empty, that there's no here here, if you will, uh, does not in any way change the uh, diagrams reflecting the sentence accurately. Now, if when you diagram your premises, the conclusion appears, you'll see this. Uh, all SRP looks like this. And notice when you go back, I'm sure I've got to get a little bit better uh, handle on my bamboo pen. When you compare this diagram to this area, you'll see that it's not the case that all S are P. So this argument is invalid. All right, let's do another. Lots of marketing majors do not enjoy statistics, but they have to study statistics. So some people who have to study statistics do not enjoy statistics. All right, so first let us identify, uh, I want the pen, and let's make it red this time. I want to identify the conclusion. Here's my indicator word. Some people who have to study statistics do not enjoy statistics. So uh, you can see we've got the quantifier stated for us, some. And then we have two classes, people who have to study statistics and people who do not enjoy statistics. So we have S for people who have to study statistics and P for people who enjoy statistics. Notice we've got the negation, so we have an O claim. Some S are not P. Now let's identify the other elements in the argument. Uh, people who enjoy statistics we find up here, we have uh, people who have to study statistics here, and then marketing majors is our middle term. Here again, the they um, refers back to marketing majors. Now, how many uh, marketing majors? Well, lots, and lots is not uh, the entirety of the class of marketing majors. So we have some M are not P, but they, marketing majors, have to study statistics. Now here, the we're gonna take this kind of standard approach to interpreting the implicit quantifier. I think from the context of the argument, it's not 100% obvious that the implicit quantifier is a universal, but the um, it, if we think about um, a marketing major, it is probably the case that we're talking about every marketing major uh, being required in the course of their study to take statistics. So we're going to go with all. All marketing majors are people who have to study statistics, and so now we've got our standard form not pretty, I know, because my writing is garbage, but 
my handwriting. It's not the most legible, even when I'm not using a bamboo stylus. Now let's go ahead and then this bad boy. I'm going to change the pen color for our um, uh, 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 for our diagramming. Okay, rule number two. When you have a universal premise and a particular premise, you are going to diagram your universal first. Think about why that's the case. If you diagram your particular first and then you have to shade out the area where the particular uh, claim has been diagrammed, in other words, you have to shade out the area where the X is, you gotta move that X anyway. So eliminate the areas where the X couldn't go first. So rule number one is you always only diagram your premises. If when you diagram your premises, your conclusion thereby appears, the argument is valid. Rule number two, if you have a universal premise and a particular premise, diagram your universal first. Now this time, I'm not going to separate out the uh, circles. So uh, you'll notice in um, the textbook that Baronet numbers each of the uh, circle areas so that you can say, okay, shade area one or shade area one and two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just for visual clarity, I'm going to avoid uh, numbering. I may do it sometimes, but I'm going to avoid numbering and then just describe the areas where the shading occurs. So in this case, all MRS, we're shading the area of M that is outside of S. And remember, we're shading or we're dealing with, we're diagramming the MS relationship so the P relationship, uh, or sorry, the P class is just not on our radar. It's not relevant. Now it's relevant to the extent that by shading this area, we are preventing um, an X from going there, but it's not relevant to the diagramming of the minor premise. Now we get the following, some M are not P. So here's where we could, we have a couple of options, right? We've, here's our area of, oops, sorry. Here's our area of M that is outside of P. Okay, so we've designated or lined the areas uh, that, we, I, that we need to stay out of, right? So we're, we need to say some M are not P. By the way, I know that you can, tell that the, um, this um, slide looks slightly different than it did just a moment ago, but that's because I messed up and had to reproduce the work. So anyway, um, it's, it's unattractive, but it, but it still works. Okay, so we've got, um, here's, the, here's the P area that we have to stay out of, and then here's the M area that we need to stay in in order to diagram the claim some M are not P. So we're going to put an X in the area of M that's outside of P. And sorry, I didn't mean for this line to go over. That was an accident. Um, and I don't think I know how to erase. But in any event, the point is that we're in this area of M, right, that is outside of P. We can't put an X here because there's no here here. It's all shaded. But So we have to put our X here. Okay, now we stop and we look at the conclusion. If the argument is valid, then we get the following. By diagramming the premises, we get an X in the area of S that's outside of P. Some S are not P, and that's true. Here is an X in the area of S that's outside of P. So this argument is valid. Next, pretty flowers make good gifts. That's because lilacs are pretty flowers and make good gifts. Once again, let's start, let's use a new color, blue. Let's start with identifying our conclusion. You know that the phrase that's because or the word because, the word because indicates a premise um, coming up 
right? And then that refers back to the sentence previously. So the premise coming up is evidence for the that, which is pretty flowers make good gifts. So let me go ahead and write it out. Pretty flowers make good gifts. Um, we know that pretty flowers is the subject class, right? The verb make is going to uh, be uh, pushed into the predicate class because we need our copula, are things that make good gifts, right? So now we've got our subject class and we've got our predicate class. Now we need to identify our major and minor premise. Uh, pretty flowers is the subject class. And so uh, we see here, lilacs are pretty flowers. That becomes our minor premise. And that leaves things that make good gifts um, will be the major premise. Now, what are the things that make good gifts? Uh, we've got um, lilacs. No capitalization there. Uh, lilacs are things that make good gifts. Okay, so I'm sorry, I just have to laugh. My writing is just awful and I'm really trying hard. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to take some more bamboo training. After all this time, I still can't do it right and it just looks terrible. Okay, let's go ahead and um, pretend like that that it's just awesome. Let's Let's pretty this up. Um, first, I hope it's clear to you uh, that what we're doing in terms of cleaning up our sentences, we're making the structure of our sentences as well as the content, right, uh, clearer, more explicit. And that's a good thing. Um, you know as well as I do that in communicating of any sort, clarity is key um, for success. So uh, it should be the case that it's clear that when we're talking about things that make good gifts, for example, we're talking about the lilacs. Now let's go on and um, look to our quantity and quality. Um, it looks like we've got implicit quantifiers here. And typically imp implicit quantifiers are universals. And they are, in this case, affirmatives. We don't have any negatives here. So now I'm going to go ahead and rewrite uh, this um, uh, categorical syllogism in um, standard form using our um, S, P, and M for uh, respectively minor, major, and middle terms. So first, all S, R, P, and then um, pretty flowers is S, that's the minor term, so that means lilacs is the middle term, all M, R, S. And I'm not sure why my pen is making almost like block, like geometrical shapes, but I'll see if I can figure that out before the next practice set. Um, and then lastly, uh, all M, R, P. Okay, next, let's go to um, black All right, S, P, M. And remember, we're shading, shading, shading. Um, and I don't mean shading three 
circles. I don't mean shade, shade, shade. I just am emphasizing the fact that we've got universals, so we're shading, right? That's all we're doing. All MRP. Shade the area of M outside of P. You're ignoring the S class. You know why? Because we're dealing with the claim that is uh, about the M and the P relationship. Now, all M or S, we're dealing with the MS relationship, so we're ignoring the area of um, overlap with P. And we've shaded everything we need to shade. If the conclusion were to appear, it, we would have this whole area shaded, right? So if this argument were valid, this whole area would be shaded, right? We would say, see all SRP, but we don't. So the argument is in valid. All right, you ready for another one? Let's do it. Next, volleyball players are superb athletes. Some hikers aren't superb athletes, so some hikers aren't volleyball players. We already know the drill with respect to um, making sure that we identify our conclusion first. And our conclusion, as you can see from the indicator word so, is some hikers aren't volleyball players. Let's go ahead and try magenta. That'll be fun. All right, so we've got our conclusion, our quantifier, sum, and it is a particular negative. And we're going to identify our subject class of the conclusion, which is the minor term. Volleyball players is the uh, predicate of the conclusion. That's the major term. Let's go ahead and write that down here at the comp uh, in the area for the conclusion. <clears throat> okay. Volleyball players, superb athletes, or sorry, let's go with hikers. Hikers, and that leaves superb athletes as the middle term. So uh, volleyball players appears in the subject position of the first premise. That is our major premise. The quantifier is the implicit universal. It's an affirmative. All volleyball players are superb athletes. That leads, leaves the second sentence as our minor premise. Some hikers are not superb athletes and then we've already established our conclusion. Next, let's diagram our syllogism. Remember, when you have a universal uh, premise and a particular premise, diagram your universal first. We talked about why that's the case. All P, R, M, Now the area that we are addressing for our second premise, our minor premise, is the uh, SM relationship and the area is that area of S that is outside of M. So we put an X somewhere in S that's outside of M. We can't put an X in this area of, SP, of the SP overlap because, remember, it's empty. There's no there there. You can't put anything there. Now we stop. Remember, rule number one, diagram your premises only. 
then look to see if after you've diagrammed your premises your conclusion appears your conclusion is some s are not p and in fact that a conclusion appears and the argument is valid let's continue there are a lot of biology majors some of whom study genetics it follows that some students study genetics first off let's get our conclusion identified um, let's try I don't know how to pronounce this word cyan that looks to me like uh, turquoise anyway it follows that is our conclusion indicator phrase we've got our quantifier sum and then we have students study genetics let's separate out our classes students are people who study genetics or students are individuals who study genetics etc cetera, etc cetera. just make sure that your class of genetics studiers is a um, a noun phrase so you could say it follows that some students are genetic genetics studiers or what would be probably more idiomatic is uh, people who study genetics okay so um, let us make sure that we have um, our um, minor and major terms identified in the premises so just above almost immediately above our identified major term we have um, the appearance of it in the second premise and then notice that um, we've got the following we've got uh, biology majors and then we've got the phrase some of whom so it looks like the sum of whom the of whom is biology majors uh, are people who study genetics so we've got uh, biology majors as the middle and middle now the question is where is our minor term in all of this well if it's not entirely clear let's go ahead and, and map out what we've got we have some s r p there are a lot of biology majors now if you take a look at the fact that this is a complete sentence we get the following some x r m x is at present an unidentified class so for right now um, let's go ahead and put that in the minor uh, premise some x r m because what we might need to do is come back uh, well we not might need to do this we will need to do this but what we might need to do is revisit the identified minor premise but let's move on to uh, the major premise uh, there are a lot of biology majors is your minor premise and then we get some biology majors are people who study genetics so some middle term are P people who study genetics so is it the case that in the minor premise we get um, the following should it be the case that X is students some students are biology majors and that would fit um, it would fit I think better than saying um, that students who study genetics is a single class alternatively if you did do that if you said um, student study genetics is the single class right so we would get this some x r p then the question is what is x is it the case that x should be students are students who study genetics right such that 
when we go back up to our minor premise, there are a lot of biology majors, should we say, some students are biology majors, some of those biology majors are people who study genetics, and that does seem to work. All right, so now let's go ahead and diagram the argument. Now, this is the first time in our practice we've come across a syllogism with two particular premises rather than either two universals or one universal and one particular. So you're going to notice as we work through this that um, it's not always obvious where to put your X's. So what I'd like to do is um, pull off to the side the MS relationship and the MP relationship. Um, and let's go ahead and uh, diagram in the order that the premises appear. So there's no rule about uh, what to do, which premise to diagram first when both are particulars. So some MRP, some SRM, and now when we combine them, notice where I'm putting the X. Some MRP, some M. R, S, and we get X's on the line. That's because we could do the following. So bear with me, I'm gonna draw, since I kind of ran out of room, I'm gonna draw the same circles and I wanna show you why we put the X on the line. So some M, R, S, let me change the color here. Some MRS tells us that this is the area where the X needs to go. What we don't know, however, is if the X is here in the MS area uh, that is outside of P or the MS area that is inside of P as well. Similarly, if we look at the claim some MRP, it could be the case that the X goes here in the MP area that's outside of S or the MP area that's inside of S. So we put the X on the line to designate, by way of this line straddling, to designate that it's unclear where the X is supposed to go. Now let's review what we know about validity. An argument is valid when it's impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. You'll notice that the conclusion, some SRP, could be true. Here's a case where we have an X that is in the SP area overlap. So the, so the argument's conclusion could be true, but that's not good enough. The argument's conclusion must be true. And since it's the case, when we diagram our particular claims, we're not forced, right? That's what the line straddling is all about. We're not forced to put an X in this area of overlap. Here we have diagrammed the premises in such a way that they're reflective, uh, or that the diagram reflects true premises. But the conclusion, some SRP does not appear, this area does not have an X in it. So the line straddling tells us that the conclusion could be true, could be false, we just don't know. Hence, the argument is invalid. Next, hi, uh, ferrets are terrific pets, hyenas are not ferrets, so hyenas are not terrific pets. Let's go back, oh, white's not the best idea since our uh, screen is white. Let's use red. All right, the conclusion, hyenas are not terrific pets. How many hyenas? Well, the implicit quantifier is all, 
right? So we get all hyenas are not terrific pets. And what do we know about the phrase all are not? That's actually a universal negative. No hyenas are terrific pets. Now let's find terrific pets. It appears in the first sentence. Ferrets are terrific pets. All ferrets are terrific pets. I'll just go ahead and repeat it here. All ferrets are terrific pets. Hyenas are not ferrets. All hyenas are not ferrets. We know that all are not is translated in a categorical proposition propositional uh, notation as no ferrets are, or uh, sorry, no hyenas uh, are ferrets. And then we've already got our conclusion. So uh, in this case, we have uh, used H and TP and F to uh, stand in for our uh, classes, our respective classes. Um, and apart from the fact that we're not using S, M, and P, uh, our argument is in standard form, right? We have our major premise um, on top, first in the order, our minor premise, second, and then our conclusion. Let's diagram. So our middle term is ferrets, our minor term, hyenas, and our major terrific pets. Notice that we have uh, universals, so we don't need to worry about which to diagram first. We can just uh, diagram them in order. All ferrets are terrific pets. We shade the area of F that's outside of terrific pets, and we ignore the line designating the hyenas class because that's not um, at issue for us in diagramming the first premise. Then we move on to no HRF. Diagram, diagram, diagram. We're shading the HF area of overlap. Now if the argument is valid, we will see the H T P area of overlap is shaded. And it's not, right? You'll you'll see here that there's an area where something could very well be. So this argument is so this is a long argument. It's long insofar as it contains a lot of words, but that doesn't scare us because we have a system. Our system involves identifying our conclusion and identifying our quantifiers, identifying the quality of the sentence, and identifying the subject and predicate class of each proposition. Let's start with the conclusion, consequently. So we're going to take what comes after consequently and identify the quantifier, many is some. Let's write that down here. Elementary education specialists, that's going to be S. And then notice we have a negation, so some S are not. P is people who think no child left behind should remain a federal law. Now we can take our elements and find them in the rest of the argument. Elementary education specialists, um, and then people who think no child left behind should remain a federal law, P. All right, so if the S is in this first sentence, that means this is the minor term. Many is some, so some S, R and then M is going to be what's left over, right? That's the only currently unidentified um, uh, class. So common chord standards reflect solid educational theory, that's M. 
And then we've got Common Core again. Anyone who thinks the Common Core standards reflect solid educational theory does not think No Child Left Behind should remain a federal law. So we've got M, R, P, but notice anyone is a universal, but a universal negative. No M, R, P, some S, R, M, some S, R, not P. Let's diagram. All right, we know that we have to diagram our universal first so that we shade out an area uh, that might otherwise uh, be occupied by an X. So no MRP is diagrammed as follows. Some SRM, this is the only place for the X to be. Now let's take a look at the conclusion. Some S are not P. What we need is an X in the area of S that's outside of P, and we have it, so the argument is valid. Social workers are dedicated to helping others in need. Whoever is dedicated to helping others in need is unusual. Consequently, social workers are unusual. Let's stick with blue. Consequently, social workers, subject class, unusual people, predicate class. Social workers, subject class, unusual people, predicate class. That means people dedicated to helping others in need is the middle term. So we've got the following S, P, uh, oops, I was about to write SM. It should be MPSM. Now the question for you is, what is our quantity and quality? Social workers, the sentence uh, context suggests that we've got a universal. Whoever is a universal, and we don't have any negations here. We don't say whoever is dedicated to helping others is not unusual. So we've got universal affirmative, universal affirmative, and again, universal affirmative. Notice that here, one of the things I've done is help myself um, to, uh, you know, take up less um, print space by simply putting my quantifier uh, off to the side. And also the quality is uh, expressed here as well. And then just SP, uh, SM, and MP respectively. All right, so now we're ready to diagram. Since we've got two universals, it doesn't matter which we diagram first, we can diagram them in order. All MRP, all SRM, Stop. What's left? Have we diagrammed the conclusion, all SRP? In fact, we have. Notice that all of the S's, if there are any, are right here in this overlap of S and P. So the fact that this area is empty is not relevant to the fact that the entirety of the S class outside of P is empty. Whatever S's there may be, they're in the P class. Here we have another long argument, but we're not afraid. We have a system. Let's use green. Um, let's start with the conclusion. We've got our quantifier. Um, we also notice that we've got a quantifier here, and a negation, and we also have a negation in the conclusion. Uh, we don't have an explicit quantifier, but 99 times out of 100, I don't know if that's an actual, you know, good uh, statistic, but most of the time, 
when you have uh, an implied quantifier, it's a universal. So uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, start putting this in order. Some people who study symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disorders affecting hearing, speech, and language, or sorry, hearing, language, and speech, whew, that's a long one, that's a big S, are not people who plan to become speech pathologists. Some S are not P. Okay, let's find the symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, etc. Here we go. Symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, etc. And that is going to be in the predicate position, which means that M is in the um, subject position, grammatical subject position. And uh, we have, sorry, up here, we've got a universal. So all students majoring in communication disorders are people who study symptoms, diagnosis, et cetera. So that means students majoring in communication disorders is our middle term. Uh, our major premise is some middle term students majoring in communication disorders are not uh, people who plan to become speech pathologists. And let's go ahead and put our copula here in the second premise. Okay, do you remember when we have one universal premise and one particular premise? We diagram the universal first. So we say all M R S. we shade out the area of M that is outside the S class. Next, and I'm gonna change colors here so that we can make um, the um, diagramming explicit, some M are not P. So here's the M, P area of overlap. We know that we're looking at an M that's outside of P. So that means it's got to be somewhere here. Why can't it be in here? Because remember, we're talking about the area of M that's outside of P and we've got nowhere to put an X here, so it's got to go here. Now let's stop and look at our conclusion. Some S are not P. You can see, let's change colors again, that when we look to see if the conclusion appears, we're looking to see if there's an X within this blue outlined area, and there is, this argument is valid. Next, Palominos don't have turbocharged engines. That's because Palominos are horses and horses don't have turbocharged engines. Here again, let's identify the conclusion. Oops. I'm sorry, I went to the wrong, uh, I went forward accidentally. That, I did it again. Hold on. All right. I did it again. Let's try this one more time. Okay. That's because that refers to the first sentence because is the evidence or the premises. So Palominos don't have turbocharged engines is the conclusion. How many Palominos? All of them. All not, which means no. Palominos are creatures with turbocharged engines. Palominos are horses and horses don't
have turbocharged engines. Okay, let's diagram. We don't have to worry about or concern ourselves with which uh, um, relationship we diagram first because both of the premises are universals. We can go in order. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, I put MSMP. Let's, okay, so we've got uh, Palominos, uh, turbocharged engines, and horses. Okay, no, horses are creatures with turbocharged engines. Shade, 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 the area of overlap. There's nothing there. All Palominos are horses. I was looking at the wrong P, sorry. All Palominos are horses. So we're shading the area of Palominos that's outside the horses area. Very attractive. And we see that, in fact, the conclusion does appear. The area of overlap between Palominos and tur turbocharged engined things is empty. Many sports enthusiasts are intensely devoted to their chosen team. Many sports enthusiasts enjoy attending sporting events. So, Many people intensely devoted to their chosen team enjoy attending sporting events. Conclusion. Many people intensely devoted to their chosen team are people who enjoy attending sporting events. So we've got P, many is some, and people intensely devoted to their chosen team is S, minor term, major term, particular, affirmative. Some, S, R, P. Now let's find our subject, uh, sorry, our minor, minor term and major term in their respective conclu or sorry, in their respective premises. People intensely devoted to their chosen team is S, which means sports enthusiasts is M, and people who enjoy attending sporting events is P. So many is some, many is some. So we've got some M, R, P, some M, R, P. S. All right, let's get going. Some MRP. I'm just going in order because there is no uh, rule for which uh, premise you diagram first when you have two particular claims. Some MRP. Remember why we put the X on the line. We put the X on the line because we don't know if the M that's a P is outside or inside the S class. Some S are M. Again, we don't know if the S that's an M is outside or inside the P class. Consequently, we don't know if there is must be, I should say, uh, an X in the area of the SP overlap. So this argument is invalid, right? Remember, here's a way to show the conclusion is false. When I diagram the premises, I could do so in a way 
that shows us there is an MP, uh, sorry, there is an X in the MP overlap area. There's an X in the MS overlap area, but there's no X in the SP overlap area. Next, what I would like you to do at this point, if you haven't already started doing it, is um, to pause the video and read this argument and then uh, come back to the video after you have put the argument in standard form and you've diagrammed it and compare what you've done with what I do. So go ahead and take a, take a moment or a couple minutes to work through this. I'm All right, I hope that went well for you. Let's do the same thing again. Go ahead and pause the video and uh, work through this argument and then check your work against my work. Okay, let's work on this one together. No one in law enforcement knows the location of paintings stolen from the Isabella Gardner Museum in 1990. Someone knows the location of the paintings stolen from the Isabella Gardner Museum in 1990. Consequently, someone is not in law enforcement. So um, let's rework this so that we make clear what our classes are. We, we know that um, the conclusion is there is someone, there is some person, someone, some somebody, and that person is not in law enforcement. No one in law enforcement, so no P, no one in law enforcement uh, knows the location of the paintings. There is someone, so some person, some someone exists, who does know the location. Remember, diagram your premises only. 
And when you have one premise that's a universal and one that's a particular, diagram that universal first. Sum S or M, the X has to go in that area of overlap between S and M. It can't go here precisely because this is empty. There's no here, here, and it wouldn't go on the side anyway, the X. So is it the case that sum S are not P? Yes. The argument is valid. Most children are bratty nuisances. No bratty nuisances should be tolerated. So most children shouldn't be tolerated. Go ahead and work this on your own and then come back and take a look at what I've done. So uh, in this case, I went ahead and uh, put the argument in, um, or sorry, reorganized the argument in such a way that I eliminated uh, the words um, for the subject and predicate classes of each sentence, and I ended up with uh, some CRB, no BRT, so some CR not T, and then I uh, put the argument in standard form and then uh, tested it by way of the Venns. Next, werewolves aren't real, but they are scary, so nothing real is scary. Okay, the conclusion is no real thing is scary or nothing real is scary. So no R is S. Werewolves aren't real. No werewolves are real. So werewolves must be M, the middle term. And then R is stuff that's real. Why do I have a universal negative? Because we're saying werewolves as a whole are not. None of the werewolves are real. No werewolves are real. They, werewolves, are scary. All werewolves are scary. All right, let's diagram. Werewolves is our middle term. Um, oh, sorry, I wrote... M for middle term, but I meant to use W for werewolves. Uh, real, scary. Okay, doesn't matter which we diagram first because both premises are universals. All werewolves are scary. I know you're gonna miss my diagrams after this class is over. Just artistic genius. No werewolves are real. What do you think? Valid or invalid? Invalid. Why? Because if the argument were valid, this whole area of overlap between real things and scary things would be shaded, but it's not. So the argument is invalid. All right, we've got a few more to go. Um, let's continue on as we have done by identifying our uh, conclusion and working from that to the major and the minor premise. Whatever is graceful isn't elegant is our conclusion. So all graceful things are not elegant things, which means no SRP. Graceful things, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Graceful things is uh, the uh, minor term. The minor term appears in the second premise. So, and we can see here's the copula that it's the predicate of the minor premise they are graceful. They are elephants. How many elephants? Implicitly all. All elephants are graceful is the minor term. So 
Um, since we've already used E here for L again, I'll use L for elephant. All elephants are graceful. And then we have elephants aren't elegant. So all elephants are not elegant, which means no elephants are, oops, that's a middle term. Sorry about that. No middle term are major term. Now we're ready to diagram. No MRP. All MRS. Invalid. Why? Because our conclusion, no SRP, does not show up. Here again, we have an argument that uh, in terms of, of number of words is a bit long. Uh, go ahead and manage this one on your own and then check back to see, to compare what you've done with what I've done. All right, did we come up with the same answer? Did we come up with the same standard form arrangement and the same diagram? I hope so, assuming I did it right. <laughs> argument is, the argument is valid. A couple more. Let's do the same thing again. You work on your own and then check back to see what I've done. All right, so what I did here first was I took the conclusion, um, put it underneath the line. I have no CP, no curious people, or people who lack imagination. Then I took uh, the major term, found it in its corresponding premise, and put that on top. No people who love to read are people who lack imagination. Then the remaining premise is the second one. All people who love to read are curious people. And then I just jotted over the original uh, standard form outline uh, S, P, and M for respectively uh, minor, major, and middle terms, and then diagrammed the argument. And as you can see, the conclusion, no SRP, does not appear. Some people are good artists. Some artists are naturally talented. So some people are naturally talented. I'm going to Use gray for the first time. Let's see what it looks like. Not bad, a little light, but not the best. Okay, some people are naturally talented individuals. Some SRP. Naturally talented individuals occurs in the second uh, uh, sentence. So some MRP. We know that M, that artists is M because naturally talented individuals is the major term it appears in the predicate position of the sentence that leaves some s r m and actually to keep the um uh the terms consistent i should have good here so sorry about that um in order for, for you to know that you've got the same uh class repeated here you need to have good artists in both, or, or just artists in both. All right, now we're ready to diagram. You're probably getting comfortable at this point, I hope anyway, with diagramming uh, X's that don't uh, uh, go entirely inside or outside of a circle, but instead straddle a line. So some MRP, some SRM, some SRP, maybe, maybe not. The argument is invalid. Uh, I think this is the last one. I'm not sure. If it's not, we'll keep going. 
Oh, you know, we haven't done magenta yet. Let's try magenta. All right. It follows that. Or maybe we did do magenta, and I just don't remember. In any case, some students, genetic uh, studiers, I think we did this one already. Let's do it again. That's okay. Uh, a lot. That's some again. Some, right? So we're going to have some some and some so uh we've got um what let's go with the the middle term first um we've got biology majors uh so there are a lot of biology majors some biology majors study genetics so it looks like biology majors is the middle term and uh, students who study genetics is the predicate class. And then we'll have, uh, let's do S for students who are biology majors. So uh, some M, R, P, some S, oh, yeah, some S, R, M, some S, R, P. You ready for the line straddling again? Some M R P, some S R M, some S R P. The conclusion is not forced. It does not appear and can't be otherwise after diagramming, hence the argument. All right, I hope you found this practice helpful. Um, if you want to uh, keep working on the VENs uh, by way of exercises in the book and you want to check your answers, uh, let me know and I can either check them for you if you email them to me or uh, I can send you the answer key. We're going to keep practicing as we move into studying the categorical syllogism from the traditional interpretation of the universal proposition. Um, and we will study that uh, uh, in terms of both uh, Venn diagramming for as a test, as a method of testing, as well as in both the modern and the traditional interpretations, studying the rules of the syllogism as uh, tests for a syllogism to pass uh, or fail to be called respectively valid or invalid. So more on that later.